the case of Dr. Mabusa, we're not dealing with a human being of value, but with an evil criminal who only escaped the gallows by entering an insane asylum. One less insane criminal in the world. Silence! You have no idea. No one has any idea what kind of phenomenal superhuman mind has come to an end with Dr. Mabuza's death. This mind would have laid waste to our whole rotten world, which is long overdue for destruction. This godless world, devoid of justice and compassion, consisting only of selfishness, cruelty, and hatred, this mind would have destroyed mankind, which itself knows only destruction and extermination, and which could only have been saved in its final hour through terror and horror. Mabusa the criminal? Mabusa the genius! Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. And we're up to episode 13, and so Cole, what is your choice? My choice this time is The Testament of Dr. Mabuza by Fritz Long from 1933, starring Rudolf klein Rogue as Mabuza, Otto Wernicke as Inspector Lohmann, and Oscar Beregi Sr., as Professor Baum, and it is based upon Norbert Jacques' novel, Mabuza's Colony. So fill us in on the story. It begins with Hofmeister, whom we don't know at that point, as a former police detective dismissed from the force for taking bribes from a counterfeiting ring that he got tangled up in. And he does kind of look like a sleazy criminal. We're not sure who he is at the no, very he, beginning. No, he looks very much like a denizen of the underworld. Yes. He's cowering in fear in this cacophonous storage room of a print shop, and he has uncovered a vast criminal conspiracy in an attempt to redeem himself in the eyes of his supervisor, Inspector Lohman. But before he can relay this information to Lohman, he is driven mad with fear and taken to an asylum run by Dr. Baum. The asylum also houses Dr. Mabuza, super criminal. Super, super criminal. With whom Dr. Baum is obsessed. Mabuza sits in his cell, scribbling madly, dictating plans to be carried out by his criminal cabal on the outside, one of whom is Tomas, who is torn between the straight life and his love for Lily and his illicit criminal past. Mabuza's spirit possesses Dr. Baum after Mabuza dies. Baum continues to carry out Mabuza's plans in an escalating series of crimes, and meanwhile, Lohman has unraveled this mystery and goes to apprehend Baum. Baum, meanwhile, is found watching the destruction of the chemical plant that he's orchestrated. A chase ensues that leads back to the asylum, where Mabuza's ghost leads Baum into his previous cell. We see in the final shot Baum tearing at Mabuza's plans and papers, completely insane. Well, from that uh, very straightforward synopsis, it's clear that the film doesn't have much going on. <laughs> it, it's it's pretty straightforward. Well, in a manner of speaking, it sort of is. It functions... It has a foot in a number of genres. It it's does. It's procedural. It's supernatural horror. There is a romantic subplot between Tomas and Lily. That doesn't do much for me. For, for, for me For the film, either. I think. Yeah. But it has a little bit of a number of different genres that it plays pretty straight. The thing that sets it apart for me is the epic hallucinatory nature of the visuals. Well, there are a lot of things in what you just said that I want to make sure that we touch on. So where should we start? We'll start at the beginning. And since I specifically mentioned the visuals, let's immediately contradict that and talk about how disorienting the sound design is. Absolutely. Immediately. So you mentioned that very first scene when we meet Hoffmeister. And all we hear is this unrelenting mechanical pounding that felt like it was never going to end. Not only the noise, but you could see it manifesting itself physically. It was rattling bottles on tables. It was a presence. It wasn't just backdrop and sound design. One of my favorite things about it, though, you mentioned mechanical sounds. Yes, it could be that, but... 
when you begin in that slow pan across the room when you're seeing nothing but bottles and shelves and tables before you even see a human character and all you're doing is being assaulted and punished by this repetitive noise, I can't tell right away, is it machinery? Is it drums? Is it marching? It sounds like it could be any or all three of those things at once. Some sort of shelling happening, your own heart pounding, who knows? To me, it almost feels like an auditory Rorschach test, where, depending on your point of view at any given time, it could be any of those things, a combination of some of those things. It's really hard to pin down exactly what that sound is for me. It's all quite disorienting. And I think back years ago when I worked in the theater and I worked with a sound designer whose trick during a specific, very, very tense scene was to just have the bass start to go up gradually. And I was actually running the soundboard, so I just had to time it very slowly to keep ratcheting up that bass that no one knew was happening, but they could feel it at an instinctual level. Exactly. And then as soon as that tension was cut, I had to ramp it down. And it made me think of that because when that moment comes where Hoffmeister is free of the factory, it's silence. Mm -hmm. And how disorienting that feels. It's interesting that you mention how everything goes absolutely silent when he escapes the factory. We still have a lot of action as he's fleeing with barrels exploding and all sorts yes. of other things. So that silence is broken up by these frightening noises too. Bits and blasts of things. But almost in contradiction to how important the sound design is, at that point, it was the first point I probably realized that this film could function completely fine as a totally silent film, which are its roots as it is a sequel to the epic silent film that Fritz Long made a decade before, Dr. Mabuza the Gambler. And I have seen Mabuza the Gambler, and this obviously is one of my favorites of all time. I have not seen the third in the series, The Thousand Eyes of Dr. Mabuza, which Long made years later in 1960. But you hadn't seen any of these when we sat down to watch this for the show this time. So what were your initial impressions? Well, first off, You'll hear this probably with a number of our episodes, which is that I had heard about this movie from you Mm -hmm. since almost the first day I met you. So a lot of anticipation building to this. And I think that you asked me afterwards, did it live up to it? I believe you did. And I said, if I didn't, then I'm asking you now. And it surpassed those expectations. I went in really, again, knowing very, very little. Also, sadly, as I was doing more research for this episode... And I am quite deficient in a lot of the other films referenced along with The Testament of Dr. Mabusa. M. M. I haven't seen Metropolis. I mean, this is starting to get sad when I say all of this out loud. So I'm starting from a deficit, and this wildly exceeded all of the expectations that I had. What about it? The visual nature of it, as you mentioned, that you could watch this with the sound off and be pretty blown away by it, especially with... The elements that I was reading, Fritz Long said later, he wished he had excised, which were a lot of the supernatural elements that are so visually astounding. And Why did he say he wanted to cut those? I don't know, but I have some theories, which maybe I'll mention later when when we get around to that. Also, just in stark contrast to the episode we had done last, The Thin Man, this is an example where the police force is really on the ball which was quite fascinating to me, and the forensic elements come into play uh, center stage in this film. So we've got the multiple genres, we've got incredible acting performances, and we have simply the profile of Dr. Mabusa, which is pretty incredible and quite frightening. You say that thing about the police being on the ball, but there are two ways, I think, to read it. One of those is definitely, yes, they aren't stooges, they aren't comic relief the way they were in The Thin Man, for instance, But Hoffmeister is corrupt. Yes, he was. He was involved in this fraud scheme, but he does have a little bit of an explanation for that. But, you know. And ultimately, do they prevent any crimes? Let me ask you this question. Could anyone prevent any of these crimes? That's true. They live on after his death. Not only that, not only the crazy supernatural aspect of it from crimes from beyond the grave, but there's also that element which is very prescient and 
more relevant now maybe than it has ever been before about the nature of terrorism and crime as terrorism and the random unpredictable nature of someone who's doing crime for crime's sake just to unsettle the populace and create civil mayhem really bring about the end of civilization as as he mentions so it's a, it's true it would be hard to predict and therefore prevent but since you mentioned M, which you haven't seen, the police don't exactly administer justice in that case either. Right, it's vigilante. Right. And so I wonder about what it is that Long is explicitly saying about the competence and role of the police force and whether or not they are as on the ball as it seems like. Maybe just in comparison to the vastly negative portrayals that we've seen. Could be. I mean, really... Wallace Beery could play Loman in the American <laughs> version. That's right. <laughs> but so setting all of that aside, mm-hmm. okay, the very first thing that occurred to me is a preoccupation that I have had since I was a child, which is that there are master evil humans or non humans operating in the world who are there to cause us harm. For example. For example, J.R. Ewing. <laughs> <laughs> and Darth Vader. So you know the era in which I grew up. The same as you, but I'm slightly younger, so I had a little bit more of the Darth Vader and the J.R. Ewing in my formative years. Mm-hmm. It actually took up a lot of space in my brain when I was a kid. Think, Oh, and I'm sorry, another one, Jabba the Hutt. Sorry again for the Star Wars influences. But I saw these depictions of these humans and non-humans pulling these strings bringing about pure destruction. I was really terrified of J.R. Ewing, actually. I thought that he might, he or someone like him, might insert themselves in my community and do those sorts of things to my family. I was really concerned about this for a while. (laughs) And so it really lived in my brain. And Dr. Mabusa is the perfect example of that. And thank goodness I didn't see that when I was six years old, because I probably would still think the same thing. Actually, I'm not sure I don't still think the same thing. (laughs) But yeah, he falls squarely in that category of this concept that terrified me. It probably would have been even more terrifying had they left certain elements in the film that were in the novel. There's a whole section in the film that describes the genesis of Mabuse's dictating of his plans. At first, he is just making drawing shapes in the air with his hands. And then they realize, oh, he is writing. And so they give him something with which to write on. And so it starts as squiggles and doodles. And it slowly evolves over the course of time into language and actual drawings and blueprints for crime. In the novel... Some of the early part of that was him writing on the walls with his own blood. Oh, Jesus. I doubt they would have been able to depict that since Goebbels censored this film so heavily. We were already well into the National Socialist era in terms of them dictating what art was passable and what was not. So they already put the kibosh on this. So I don't know if that even more radical element could have even possibly been included, but it would have been 10 times more terrifying. Absolutely. So to wrap up, I thought this movie was great. Okay. Now, do you remember when you first saw it? I think you do. I do. I distinctly remember it. It was in January in 2005 and I went into a Barnes and Noble. This was before they started to routinely do their 50% off Criterion sales twice a year. I want to say this was one of their buy one, get one free or buy one, get one half off deals that they routinely did back then. And I was aware of the Criterion collection vaguely at that point, but this was the first one that I had owned. I bought this and M at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I sat in a super cold basement in Massachusetts over Christmas holidays, just watching these two films over and over and over again. This does sound in keeping with your other holiday viewings <laughs> of past. Now, did you think at any moment that maybe Dr. Mabusa had planted that sale just so you could get the film and be in a basement? Did you start did you start doing automatic writing at any point? I didn't do any of that, unfortunately. So in this basement, what did watching this film mean to you? What struck you? What struck me 
in this particular case was how much of a film education I was getting, it felt like. This was a really pivotal film to me, not only in terms of the content of the film itself, but this is what really kicked off my collecting bug. We talk a lot on the show about having a curatorial mindset and how important that is to us and how we encourage that and like to foster that in other people. And in conjunction, often, with the curatorial mindset is the habit of collecting things. You often can't do the curatorial things like do screenings, make mixtapes, do the things that are necessary to share what you love with other people until you also amass a library of your own. And that Mabusa DVD was the acorn from which this collection has grown. We're saying this collection, the one we're sitting amongst right. in our film library room that we are starting to wonder if we have to get a bigger house in order <laughs> to eventually house. Those were the first two mm -hmm. criterions. Yes. How many are we up to right now? Roughly? I am 90 or so short of being complete. Fantastic. So that's something like 700 plus. Do you recall what actually led you to this film? The cover art. Okay. Which is pretty astounding. Mm -hmm. It was hypnotic, just like it was supposed to be. Yes. It was one of those blind buys that was hitting a jackpot. I would do this all the time. I discovered a ton of things I love this way. Because I'm so often disappointed in the run-of-the-mill average release be it movie, record, whatever, I would frequently just go into record stores to start with and then later video stores and look for the thing that was the most far out and interesting and least banal and plain vanilla image on the cover that I could find. And this was definitely one of those. Do you recall if you had actually heard of the film before that moment? I had not. I was okay. aware of M. Yes. But I was not aware of The Testament of Dr. Mabusa. But it has since become almost an obsession, the collecting thing. Almost. <laughs> I don't know. It would be an obsession if it wasn't useful to us. We use it all the time. It's not like we're hoarding anything and piling up things that we are never going to implement in any way. Or going without food in order to buy right. the it's, films. It's technically... Or murdering people in order to get their collections. Hmm. It's technically not a vice... <laughs> because to me, maybe to Webster, the definition to me of vice is something that you do to your detriment. It hasn't crossed over into that territory yet. Though it but we can be, always hope. It may be close. But the thing I took from that individual purchase, after I devoured all the special features, was very much that whole criterion approach of film school in a box that they frequently talk about. They offer so much more than just the experience of watching the film. With the commentary, with the special features, they frequently teach you a better way to watch the film. Or at least teach you several things that allow for multiple interpretations. Or a whole new appreciation of a film that you might have seen several times and didn't know the background of. It's made a huge difference in my film education in general. You were not a collector necessarily. You didn't do it the same way I did. When we met, right. you had a library, but you didn't keep it the same way I did. Because I have never thought about resale necessarily oh, or condition. <laughs> what did... Well, sometimes you'll exchange things for new additions or something like right. that. Right. Okay. And to complete that thought, I, I always threw away the cases oh, yeah, or recycle the cases. You're a monster. And so I just had the disc, so I would keep those. But I collected... To Everyone the out there right now <laughs> who are listening to us because of our friends who do Criterion podcasts, for instance, their skin is crawling right now. They're screaming at their device, thinking about you throwing away artwork. Yes. Let me speak in a more soothing <laughs> tone to explain this. Yes, I did. And I realized, actually, I've got some criterions in there. I uh, I should just stop talking now, probably. I used to have a lot of VHS. And then when that fell away, I went over to a local 
store to try to sell those. And I think I was going to get about 25 cents for my huge collection, including taped off of TV MST3Ks. <laughs> and so I just sort of gave up. And also to keep providing excuses, I've moved about 500,000 times. Right. And it got to just be awful to carry around stuff from place to place to place. So I really stopped doing it. So I consolidated everything because I wanted the material, but not the housing of the material. Can you ever see a day where you go exclusively digital and you carry no physical media around with you at all? Absolutely, because I have a ton You're of terrible. digital stuff on my hard drive. You're, you're awful. That I keep upgrading. It was a get trick. more and more. <laughs> This is over. I, I'm gonna. So, Doctor Mabusa, I met him in an insane asylum. He got into my body, and then that's what set me on that path. Sorry. You are the embodiment of the re- silence. <laughs> the regime of crime. <laughs> so you're not a collector. No, I don't approach life that way. Generally, I like to have the thing, get the use out of it, and then do something else with it. I don't like it around. But when we first met and began courting and you first saw my library when i walked into the moment i walked into your apartment and saw the shelves which we now have almost twice as many as that first day i think i had a little um i probably can't say it in the podcast i got pretty excited (laughs) and i knew i was in the right place (laughs) oh but also judging by the titles i didn't just walk in and see the the mass of right. it and think great because it could be every season of gomer pile usmc i don't know but why are you slagging gomer pile uh, not my favorite <laughs> but it was great stuff when i got closer it was great stuff and then i definitely knew i was in the right place quality and quantity yes basket case as a as, <laughs> as the prime example of that that is just for people who are following Keeping track of our personal lives. The first film we ever watched together, yep. Basket Case. Yep. And we knew it was true love. Are we going to do an episode on that someday? We should do Basket Case. Boy, that thing's point. full of stuff to talk about. It is. That's true. So let me bring this all back and get away <laughs> okay. from my mistakes and how terrible I am and all the films I haven't seen and all the beautiful stuff I've thrown away. Okay. I really enjoyed watching this Criterion edition of the film from that standpoint, as you mentioned, of film school in a box. And I know I learned a lot from the commentary of the film. For example? A lot of things about Fritz Long, and I'm thinking of a specific quote that I thought you might really enjoy, which is, it's not whether you win, but whether you struggle. I do relate. (laughs) I do like that, as a matter of fact. (laughs) Yes. And in learning more about this film and learning more about Fritz Long and then reading more about him as well, it seems like there are possibly some discrepancies potentially (laughs) in the story that he has created for himself. That's being diplomatic. He is notorious for this self-constructed mythology. Dates and times don't necessarily line up with things he said he was doing and where and when he said he was doing them. Sometimes, for instance, this film, he always later characterized as anti-Nazi propaganda, essentially, which he achieved, he said, by putting the slogans and the speeches of Nazi figures into the mouths of criminals. When you look at the actual timeline Mm -hmm. and this whole notion that he fled, quote unquote, Nazi Germany in 1934, he seemed to have at least a mutually beneficial relationship with the Nazi party, possibly. It's quite unclear exactly if he was a sycophant, if he was just trying to keep his head down and not make waves so he could continue to make his art, if he was, in fact, very subtly working against the party. But it never quite matches up with the story that he tells which is also complicated by the fact that he tells multiple versions of the stories years down the line. And speaking of timelines, I'm not sure how much you can read into every single scene and every single speech because we did not, at that moment, understand or know the extent of what Adolf Hitler would eventually do. No. So I think it's being generous to say that he could essentially predict what would happen 
or could take things from the record at the time. I agree. Much like the way you could read the success or failure of the police different ways, I think the political content of the movie is just as open to interpretation. To me, it seems like you could read it as anti-Nazi propaganda, but you could also read it as writing the state a blank check to combat terrorism, much the way the U.S. did post-Gulf War. Well, and Goebbels said, as he was banning this, that it was because it showed that a dedicated group of disparate people could come together and overthrow the government, which is essentially what they did. Mm -hmm. So again, it reads on many levels, which is maybe the testament to the testament of Dr. Mabuse's lasting impact. Very good point. (laughs) Thanks. And then speaking again of these conflicting stories. So I believe I had mentioned earlier that I was reading that Fritz Long had said he wished he had excised the supernatural scenes Mm -hmm. from the film. And I'm not really clear as to why he said that, but I do have some thoughts. Okay. What, do you have any No, I'm ideas? interested to hear what you think. Well, I have a lot of different sort of pieces that I'm trying to put together, so bear with me okay. on this. So on the one hand, though I, and I think many people would consider this film part of German expressionism, mm-hmm. he had or claimed to have a problem with that or with the movement itself, so on and so forth. So you can believe that or not. But if he did feel that it was not part of expressionism, then using those supernatural elements grounds it very much in that sense of unreality. And so if you are trying not to write the government a blank check, you want Mabuse's motivations to be grounded in reality. And not this sense of an occult power with this element of hypnosis can overtake these people. You want it to be a fallible person with limited powers who once is gone... Uh, everyone else disperses from that ideology. And I think the supernatural piece elevates it so far above that because, again, his crimes live beyond him. Right. He is borderless. And it doesn't matter if he's in prison. It doesn't matter if he's in an insane asylum. It doesn't matter if he's dead. These things will continue into perpetuity as long as there is a person to continue that forward. So, again, in using these occult powers, does he, in essence, give the gang characters and out because they have not necessarily accepted of their own volition that they've been actually victims of mind control so they are not responsible for not the respo- crimes they commit right so- there's only one supreme figure to be held responsible mm-hmm. and if that figure is a supernatural figure that transcends man's laws a superman in fact mm-hmm. if you want to get into all that <laughs> yeah then how does that detract from Long's overall vision, the supernatural element? If what he is indeed trying to present is the implication that Hitler mass hypnotized an entire country and it is critical of the Superman because it positions the Superman figure as an arch criminal, how does that detract from what he was trying to say overall by including that supernatural element? Maybe he meant it to be even more realistic. Maybe he wished he had grounded it in the place of this is, in fact, a direct statement against Hitler. I don't know. Which would have been impossible. Which would have been impossible. He found out later, after he made the film, obviously it didn't come out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. These forces were had been at work for many years. But he finished the film before the entire transition of power. So... Maybe he thought he would be able to sneak it through. I don't know. Or maybe it just came down to a visual element, which that I'd get even less because those are amongst the most attractive, hypnotic, amazing, accomplished scenes. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I don't have an answer. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, really on any level. I don't know why he would say that. Mm, I can't see it either because the supernatural element to it is so arresting And is effective as a metaphor, too, when you see Mabuza take possession of Baum. Just effective as a metaphor of the power and direction one person has over a much weaker mind. Plus, when he's sitting across the desk from him after he's dead, after Mabuza is dead, and he appears in that more reptilian version of himself, 
that is such a great image and so frightening and intimidating. And we've talked about several examples of these arresting images. For me, though, for the most part, the camera felt quite static. It's positioned in one place. There's a huge amount of action. Right. But there's not a lot of uh, camera movement angles. Or it, do, it certainly doesn't feel like kind of a virtuoso camera performance to me. You should watch Mabuza the Gambler. Okay. Then, because I think of actually both of these films and a number of films like them as proto-action films. People who watch contemporary films and think, oh, old movies are boring. Old movies don't have these action elements in them are really missing out. In this film alone, for instance, the gunfights, the car chases, the factory explosions, all still staple elements in action films 80 years later that are done extremely well, extremely effectively. And you can go back even further before this, and you've got, on this side of the ocean, Buster Keaton and all the outlandish stunts that he did. If you think of old films, early talkies, or even silence as static and boring and not potentially full of action, then you are missing out. Absolutely. And so instead, for me, the highlight is really the editing. Rather than virtuoso camera work. Yes. Well, the editing is certainly virtuoso. It is so fun to see how they attached one scene to the next. A number of different interesting techniques. It could be that... The character that was speaking when they make the jump cut to the very next scene is answered by a character miles or hours away. It could be something as simple as a character looks to one side of the screen and then the character in the very next scene looks back as if in response or looks in the same direction as if they're both looking at the same thing. The sound sometimes frequently carries over from one cut to the next. There are rhyming elements. There's some pun elements that happen, too. Yes, it is fantastic. The editing of the thing is probably the most effective element of the of all of the filmmaking elements they use to construct this. And not just the linking devices that are extremely clever, but the brashness of it and the sense that everything is happening in real time and is also timeless, mm -hmm. which is odd, and I'm not sure I can fully explain that. But everything is happening at the same time, and yet you're running out of time and you're running towards something in the distance that's constantly moving away. The film never lets you forget the clock is ticking. Yes. In fact, quite literally, when a clock is ticking, towards the end, when our juvenile leads, for lack of a better phrase, our romantic couple are in peril, locked in a room with a bomb that they are trying to survive and figure out a way to thwart. And I had also read that this style of editing really influenced Sergei Eisenstein. However, Battleship Patinkin was before this, so I think of that as really kind of the pinnacle of Mandy the montage. <laughs> Potemkin? <laughs> Potemkin, sorry. Battleship Potemkin. And I've got another set of little fun facts for this film and about Fritz Long. And that is that Thea von Harbu, who was his wife and collaborator on this film, also wrote M, mm -hmm. was totally uncredited for Metropolis, unfortunately. And she was a quite prolific writer, activist, actress, director, on and on and on. And so they were married at the time. They were divorced. Shortly They after. were divorcing sort of in the process. Right. She was actually uh, first married to the actor who played Mabusa. Hmm. I didn't know that. Absolutely. And Fritz Lang would often use people again and again, and he happened to be one. And so so she was married to Rodolf Kleinroga, and then 10 years later, they collaborated on this after she had left him when she had an affair with Fritz Lang. Also, there's the question of the stories that she created for herself as well. She's been accused of being a collaborator. She actually stayed in Germany. Mm. He had said that that was one of the reasons they divorced, because he wanted to leave and she wanted to stay. Whether or not that was true, she also had an affair with a young student, 17 years, her junior, and she secretly married him, but he was an Indian. And so the Nazis wouldn't accept him, and so she said she simply stayed there and continued to do this work so the marriage could be recognized eventually. Do you know how often I think I would love to 
see the Weimar Republic up close and personal. Not just in Cabaret. <laughs> that was freewheeling. It certainly was. So, thanks for nothing, Nazis. <laughs> just one more thing to add to the list. Gosh. And speaking again of the Nazis, there's a moment that I noticed, and this also might go back to reading too much into something, but when Dr. Baum is speaking to his class towards the very beginning of mm -hmm. the film, and he's talking about Mbusa, it really seems like at one point his arm shoots up into almost that hile. But again, I could be looking at it over the span of time right. instead. He's obviously very passionate about it. It's clear that he is obsessed with this character even before he and Loman have that interaction that we reenacted at the beginning mm -hmm. of the show, after Mabuza is dead. Because in that scene where he is speaking to his class and he brings up Mabuza as an example of the psychosis he's talking about, one student leans over to another, essentially saying, here we go with this again. Mm -hmm. So he is clearly obsessed with the man before it becomes at all clear that he is being controlled. That that or he, that he's right. Right, exactly. Really. Yeah, because most people in the class are kind of disinterested, really. Until Some start to pay attention. They show that slide of Mabuza, and the entire class jumps back in their seats. Because he is thrust forward in his hospital bed in this unmovable position that he's constantly aware, and you see that crazy profile again. Mm. What I love, though, ultimately, it comes down to a voice behind a ratty curtain that's calling the shots for this gang. Like the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. So ultimately, is it telling us no matter how ambitious or hyper-intelligent, when it comes down to it, criminals are just dirty, grubby criminals? I think in part, but I think also it's interesting to see what the superhuman or if you want to take that out, the higher level human or the mastermind, what happens when that figurehead has to rely on humans? Mm. Your run-of-the-mill dirty criminals to fulfill these plans. Even though you have to rely on mere mortals as a superhuman to carry out your commands, the group can be really effective sometimes. This unit 2B that does the really dirty jobs for Mabusa I think in particular, one of my favorite scenes is when they assassinate Dr. Crom, who has just come from a meeting with Baum, who says that he has uncovered this coincidental relationship between Mabuza's writings and a jewelry heist that has just happened, and they are sent to dispatch him. It's one of my favorite scenes in the whole thing because of these beautiful overhead shots of the street scenes. And it's very choreographed. It depends on placement of cars and timing and horns honking. Again, this really neat sound design mm -hmm. element to it. Though, after all is said and done, through excellent forensic detective work, they are apprehended and connected to that crime. They do not get away with it. They don't. There's a big shootout and the petty nature of... or. Not necessarily petty nature. The individual nature of each criminal comes into play to bring about their overall downfall. Right. Because they are humans when it comes down to it. They are not a master criminal gang at that level, at the level that he has created in his mind. So things are beginning to crumble for the gang and to be pieced together by a number of different characters. Dr. Crom, whom we mentioned. He's starting to put this plot together and he's executed. Mm-hmm. Loman is gradually putting these pieces together and has, at this point, discovered that Hofmeister scratched Mabuse's name into a window pane. So he knows the name and has started to do the research to figure out who this Mabuse is and why the name sounds familiar to him. And the two lovers are in peril at this point because Tomas has decided he's not going to kill anybody, so they're going to kill him mm -hmm. because he's not going to fulfill an additional element of this big criminal plot. And Lohmann, again through this investigation that we were talking about, this good forensic work, he has started to track down 
and discovers Dr. Baum is somehow enmeshed in this, though he doesn't quite know how. And the scene, again, that we played at the beginning, he is not necessarily baiting him, but he is starting to see that Baum has some sort of peace tied in. He's obsessed at some level. Baum is so far in the tank for Mabuza at that point, he does not have to bait him. He stands back and lets Baum expose all of these things himself. He's been possessed by Dr. Mabusa at this point. And is clearly insane. Yes. So all of this is building to this climax in which Baum has orchestrated the destruction of this chemical plant. Which is going to have huge repercussions for the entire city and beyond. This is a massive, massive plot that Mabusa has written about. Right. This central act in his spreading web of terror. And the, again, clock starts to tick because we know the time that this fire is supposed to take place. So that kicks off this final climactic, almost apocalyptic scene that is a race to prevent the destruction of the chemical plant, which doesn't quite get saved. And then the chase back to the asylum in which they are unable to prevent Baum from getting there, attacking Hoffmeister, and being completely irretrievably insane at that point. The last thing that Lohman says is there's no job for the police here. Even though Baum is not vanquished, punished, or prevented from doing any of the criminal things that he set out to do, there is no more police work to be done. And he is ripping the pages of Dr. Mabusa's testament. I love the notion of Baum as the executor of Mabusa's crazy will. I love thinking of it <laughs> as truly a testament. It is Mabusa's last will and testament. Yes. He works feverishly to document all of these things because I think he knows his time is over. His he, mortal time on earth. Right. He dies. Baum is now the executor of his estate, for lack of a better term. And so he has bequeathed this chemical plant explosion <laughs> as a final act of implementing the plan that Mabuza laid out. And that scene alone back in the insane asylum is pretty neat again. Uh, he almost kills another person, but it's that element of a bit of sound and complete silence otherwise. Mm. He almost kills Hoffmeister critically, which shocks Hoffmeister back into sanity because Hoffmeister finally recognizes Lohman when they arrive slightly too late at the asylum. Going back to the thing that Baum was discussing in the class in the very beginning regarding the nature of shock and trauma and how it affects you psychologically. Pretty progressive, mm -hmm. too. And you may argue with me on this, but I think that the very beginning and the very end are the best parts of the movie. Why do you say that? The most exciting, the most different for me as a viewer, so much is accomplished in those little bits of time. I don't know that I necessarily disagree. Because, one, like I mentioned, the romantic subplot bogs things down for me in the middle. I don't think you necessarily need that to advance the story in any way. You could have that gangster character struggling with the life choices he's made without it having to be for the love of another person. So that does slow down the wheels of what is, like I said, essentially a proto-action film, a crime film at its heart. So no, I don't think that's necessarily right. The okay. end is extremely exciting. Mm -hmm. And I love how immediately off-putting the sound is and how disorienting that opening scene is when we don't even know what exactly it is that we are supposed to be looking at or looking for. Yeah. Or who anyone is, who is any, what their motivations are. Right. Who's All side we are know we on? Is... is that Mabusa as the viewer who's never seen mm -hmm. either of those? I didn't know. Right. We are introduced, thrown into the scene of essentially cacophony and cowering fear right off the bat. So, no, I don't disagree with you. I love both of those scenes. There are things in the middle, though, that I do like as mm. well. The scene where they have the confrontation over Mabusa's corpse. That is a particular favorite, obviously. And the scene where the technician figures out what it was that was scratched into the window pane. I do like that single moment, though, with the lovers when they rip the curtain aside and it, the shot is straight on the two of them and their faces are horrified and entirely believable. Right. So if they serve no other purpose, that was a great moment. 
that's one of those scenes in particular that makes me curious about why Fritz Long so wanted to divorce this film from the idea of German expressionism because it has a lot to do with severe shadow and light and angles, darkness, and a sort of nightmare imagery. To me, there are a number of scenes in the film that all bear the hallmarks of that expressionism. So would you say then, definitive answer, you think this film is German expressionist? I think so. Well, that leads me to a game that I have created, which strangely enough is sweeping the nation now, and it is called Ja oder Nein. Okay. The fabulous uh, film game of can you guess from the title whether this film is a German expressionist film or not? Would you like to play? I will certainly give it a try. Okay, I'm going to start you off with an easy one. So you are going to say, yes, this is German Expressionist, or no, it is not. Okay. okay. The first title is Der Blaue Angel, also known as The Blue Angel. But if these are films I know... Right, you may not know all of these films, that's what I'm saying. You okay. Could, I'm giving you an easy one to start. Yeah. Yeah. That is correct. Okay. It is. From 1930, uh, directed by Joseph von Sternberg with Marlene Dietrich. Yes, that is a film of the German Expressionist movement. So, very good. Next film. Die Geisterjäger. My German is so... Excellent. That's not the word I was (laughs) going to use. So, I'm going to go with the old... Standardized test uh, guessing format. See? When, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to move back and forth across the choices and say nine. Okay. You are correct. That is the German translation of Ghostbusters. <laughs> okay. Okay. Doing pretty well so far. Great. So the next one, I think you may have heard of this one, though. I could be wrong. And it is Schatten, eine nachtliche Hallucination. Otherwise known as Shadows, a Nocturnal Hallucination, which pretty much you should be able to guess from that. I would say, yeah, and I also Und. didn't know that there was German Expressionist porn. <laughs> close, very close. This film is from 1923, directed by Arthur Robeson, and I just want to read you the plot because okay. I can't not okay, with this. let's have it. During a dinner given by a wealthy baron and his wife, attended by four of her suitors in a 19th century German manor, a shadow player rescues the marriage by giving all the guests a vision of what might happen tonight if the baron stays jealous and the suitors do not reduce their advances towards his beautiful wife. Or was it a vision? That's the film in a nutshell, so I think we need to track that one down. I may have that now that you say that. Maybe. I have warning shadows. That's another American version of the title. That is it. So we do have it. Right. You want to watch some German expressionist wealthy baron porn later on from 1923? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, bold. (laughs) Okay. I've got one more choice for you. Okay. And this is Beethoven. With Charles Grodin? Yes. Nine. Wrong! (laughs) From 1992, it is the story of a slobbering madman being driven insane and homicidal, and it also features a dog. (laughs) Thank you for playing Ja oder Nein. 50-50. I I did okay. Wait. You did did really well. Three out of four. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to actually find Werner Herzog saying Ja or Nein. Ja. Nine. But I couldn't, and that would have involved too much work for me, so I just do it myself. Well, I think you did just fine. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of the show, I believe. It does, which is where we typically make our recommendations for further viewing based upon the film we were just discussing. So I'll let you go first. What is your recommendation? My recommendation this time is going to be for a film that was a big influence on this one, and other films that Fritz Long and other people made subsequent to that. I am recommending Les Vampires by Louis Fouillard from 1915 and 1916. It's a 10-part serial about a do-gooder journalist taking on a gang of super criminals. 
and it was roundly criticized at the time for its dubious moral content. Uh Aha. But when you go back and watch it now through 21st century eyes, or if you just have a certain moral flexibility... German expressionist porn. It was French. French expressionist porn. (laughs) (laughs) Then I think you would enjoy it quite a bit if you like The Testament of Dr. Mabusa. It is really... One of the earliest roots of that super criminal, criminal gang genre that exists in cinema, period. I wouldn't say you sit down and watch it all at once because it's about seven hours long altogether. It's a bit taxing to try to take in. But if you watch it in ten installments or a couple at a time, it's much more easy to digest. And I think you'll have a pretty good time with it. And what do you have for us? I thought about another story in which the titular character is not seen until well into the film and also features a nasty criminal enterprise, this time of an even meaner and pettier nature, and that film is The Third Man from 1949, directed by Carol Reed and featuring Joseph Cotton and Orson Welles and Alita Valley, also set in Europe, though a different time period post-World War II. We're going to do an episode about The Third Man eventually. But in the meantime, watch it and get ready for that. But yes, this is one of my favorites of all time, so we will definitely devote an entire episode to that choice because that's a great choice. Excellent. I think we have two terrific recommendations, Les Vampires and The Third Man. Which brings us to the end of another episode. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can reach us at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Facebook. If you just search Magic Lantern Podcast, you can find our page. We are on Twitter at lantern underscore cast. And I would like to thank some people this time around for tweeting about the show since our last episode. As always, Grindhouse Dave and Craig Eastman. Thanks, guys. We always appreciate that. Cheryl Jones from Movies Made Me, the guys at Cinematic Immunity, and Hugh and Rod from Hungry Dads. We really appreciate the mention. We also got a really nice review on iTunes this week from Wacky Juan. Love it. It was one of those that I really like to see in that he apparently heard our No Country episode and immediately wanted to go back and watch the film. We love it when we inspire people to revisit those things that they really enjoy. So thanks for that. If you would like to leave us a review, you can find us on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. Anytime you take the trouble to do that, we really appreciate it. And if you would like to find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, you can find our website at magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast.